hands by now. Hello and welcome to the National Leprechaun Museum's talking series and today we're talking books. Yeah we're talking books which is why we have books on the table. No, I see the more over this side. Okay. It's quality, not, not uh, quality. Okay, yeah, <laughs> it's not about okay, that. Good. I was actually amazed to see that you narrowed it down to so few books. Um, okay. It's obviously a passion of yours, books. Yeah, I was got a bit of note here. I'm kind of the Ross Geller of stories. <laughs> yeah, a bit creepy and nerdy about finding stories. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. the result is we end up with like amazing books. Yeah. Just lying around the place, though. Scattered. It's like an Easter egg hunt when you come into museum terms, like coming across books. But so I'm not. I'm telling you now. I'm not going to ask the question. What's your favourite book? Okay. But when it comes to us talking about books, was there one that came into your head straight away? And you were like, "Oh, I want to talk about that book." Well, there's a few that you kind of can't can't go without making reference to that one. Yeah. And this would be the first one I would go to, which is Thomas Croft and Croker. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the actual title is is Fairy Legends and Tale. Fairy. Let me get it out. Fairy Legends and Traditions of the South of Ireland. Um, and so I would say that's that's one and I think this book really got me intrigued because there were voices inside the stories yeah and they had a turn of phrase or a cast of mind that you were going I can almost hear the guy talking that yeah. or the person talking that and if I was going to uh, recount this story it's a telling rather than a reading Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's what intrigued me about that book. Um, and it's one of the few books I've come across where that almost feels like every story wants to leap off the page and be told. Is it a contentious book? There's a few of them that are contentious and it's actually sitting on top of another contentious <laughs> book. Um, so, yeah. It, but well, the manner in how it was collected though, uh, when you're hearing multiple voices, I'm familiar with what there's so many different flavours in it. There is. And I think how it was gathered would probably have, have affected that. There was no, on the first, this is the second edition, the copy, the copy of the second edition, and there's no author ascribed in the first edition. Yeah. Um, and the story goes that Thomas Crofton Kroger was commissioned to write or was going to deliver the book to his publishers and lost the manuscript and ran around to his friends and asked them, did they know any stories that he could pull together? And they came together and gave him the stories um, and he put it in the publisher and it was a roaring success yeah um, and someone had to take the credit for it and he gamely stepped forward and said it's okay I'll do it lads so good yeah but we all I think we all go to school with someone like that who like on the morning when stuff something is due is on around what did you get for that yeah that's what I was that's what I was thinking too. yes um, but the awful thing is, is where other people probably would have put more work in it gets the most acknowledgement and the best results and the, be and the best response. Yes, um, and we there under uh, 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 just underneath that is um, uh, Myths and Legends, and that is a Jeremiah Curtin book, um, and he is quite problematic now. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on there, uh, which is really interesting. And these wouldn't be the first people who capitalised on the folk and fairy tradition. No. Uh, we were up at Ushin's grave in Antrim. Yeah. And that is a confection by McPherson to try and prove his, um, uh, the authenticity of his writings. But as soon as the stories go into written format, given that the stories would have originally been told and talked about by people with not that level of education, yeah. is something lost when it goes, or it, it, is, is a, are collections like this stolen works? It's a, well, you could say in the Crofton Croker, so Crofton Croker is the son of a military naval officer in Cork and coming from, uh, uh, I, I guess, uh, the garrison tradition. Mm. So it, it's cultural appropriation from the Irish storytellers. Even though he's Irish, you go, it, and it was, yeah. it was made for, uh, well, from what I understand, for a UK audience. Yeah. So... It is very much what people kind of resile against nowadays as saying that's taken from that culture and repurposed or, re or appropriated. Yeah, I suppose then it's put into a format that's not as readily accessible to the everyday people who are telling these stories. No, and you, you absolutely, um, um, I, completely, it's, it's, it's not for the people yeah, from whom it was, it was garnered. Um, and that is a certain thing on, on books, and I, I, I wrote some stuff down, but what, what you're seeing here is like it's a snapshot like 
if you think a photograph is just a fragment of an experience, yeah. then a book is just a fragment of thinking. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, we need it because it's recorded. Without the book, those stories would not be accessible to us. I suppose, like, and, and their reference point as well, because I know with a lot of books that, that we, we love around that are, that are Irish books, we then get excited when we visit the place that yeah. the book is set. I mean, we, we've done it with Circle of Friends, like we made binge books. Yes. And it's kind of just the book is points us towards the experience. Yes, and the lived experience is a, a bigger thing than the book can possibly capture. Yeah. Um, and the book comes from a particular viewpoint, so it's the author's viewpoint. Um, so it's necessarily only his viewpoint or her viewpoint, their viewpoint of a situation. Um, and when you go to see a storyteller, you can see the storyteller and the shadow they cast. Yeah. In, in an author, it's almost impossible to see the shadow they're casting on that story. Mm. So it's, it's much more difficult to unpick that. Uh, and you need to get into the backstory of why that book was put together, who was involved in it, and who it was, who was it destined for. So they become more complex in terms of teasing them apart. That's why there's so many academics who look at um, yeah, books. Yeah, but the, the transition, let's say, from a, a, a story told to a book would yeah. probably be similar. You could compare it in the same way you compare when a book goes to movie format or goes to on screen. There's things gained and things lost, but the, the translation is always quite muddied. The translation, so, and you would say, look, the point at which you read a book and then you go to see the movie and you go, that's not how I imagined that character. Yeah. Uh, that's your imagination, that, that piece of your imagination that sits between what's written on the page and what your experience is. Yeah. Um, um, so, yeah, I, look, are, what are books? Are books fodder for, for films and TV? Is that what they are? Are they manuscripts for well, it, it, the time between when a book is written and when something is produced out of that, let's say a movie or, or a series or something like that, usually is quite broad. I yes. look at stuff like The Yellow Wallpaper, uh, Sharon Perkins Gilman, that's been like 150 years and yes. now it's becoming a movie. Yeah. But if you look back to things like uh, The Exorcist, yeah. it was two years from the book coming two out. Two years, that all. That's all okay. there was yeah. in between it. But now we see that we have this body of knowledge and incredible stories that can be translated and I suppose it makes it more accessible. The movies, the movies are much more accessible. Yeah. And, uh, you know, even look at, at trailers and snippets and um, how people communicate thinking through memes and little snippets of movies. Yeah. Um, they're very effective in terms of a, a general um, sense of what, where we're at right now. Yeah. Um, but books, yeah, it, there's, there's a, there's, I'm a big fan of Jack Dirty Da, and he's, he's, he's gone. It's dead language. There, it's not the, it's not the spoken word. It's you yeah. know when, when you can't sing and dance, you write the words. Yeah, yeah that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> I can't sing or dance. <laughs> um, but that, you know, that's just, just, just it, it, it's incredibly interesting. Um, it is not the full picture. It is snapshots yeah. and viewpoints and. Uh, you have to be careful um, because one of the things we're doing, we, we do here, is tell, tell oral stories. Yeah. And you need to be confident that the stories have a veracity to them or yeah, an authenticity to them. Yeah. So you're quite careful. And if you picked up something like um, uh, William Butler Yeats' The Soul Cages, where that's an imported story, yeah. and yet it's, it's, it's presented as being uh, an indigenous story then yeah. it becomes a little bit more problematic. And that's why you've got to look at some, why we have to look at stuff carefully. But we've always done that though, like uh, when I say we, like the Irish, like where we think things go, and we claim it as ours. Yeah. And I know even, um, what's that song, Dirty Old Town? Yes. Which like people see that as like, that's a great Irish song. And yeah. it's about Manchester. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? It's, uh, but we do, we kind of kind of claim things. But for me, one of the differences between telling stories as we do here and, and books is, is a commitment thing. Like when you, publish a book there's a it's there and yeah. it's down and the way you're telling the story is down. yes now there'll be slight subtleties and different like you reading a book and me reading a book we're probably going to get very different things okay. out of it yeah and we'll hear the voice is different yeah myself and eleanor talked about that recently on another one of these videos where we're talking about when she does voices for stories yes it's like given that she's never heard the person speak yeah how does she come up with that and she okay like we hear them when we read the stories we do we do you know yeah. 
but we can only hear them within a, a certain our own parameters of what we can recreate almost. Well, you just obviously your experience first of all. Who who you, you they say you can't dream of anyone you haven't met. So they're all composites of people you've met before. So yeah. I guess the voice in your in, in your head when you read the story are snippets of people you've met before. Yeah. And also on top of that, it's part of your physical experience. So your embodied experience that you have, like my voice register d would not go as high as Eleanor's. No. Um, so I'm I'm dealing with a different set of tones. Yeah. Um, but let me just come back on, so we did these two books. Uh, uh, I think we kind of covered those off, Jeremiah Curtin and The Crop and yeah. Croker. This is another one that I, I I kind of said couldn't couldn't go by this, <laughs> which is Wild Sports of the West. You love uh, this book. I love this. I love it, and it's great. And it's it, even even the fact that it's not true. Um, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. <laughs> um, but one of the really great things about this book is that uh, Douglas Hyde had it re reprinted. Yeah. Uh, it, and he obviously felt and. Uh, in a default position, I can always go. Douglas Hyde said it's okay. It's okay by me. Yeah. Um, and he 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 had that re, 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 re republished. Um, and it's a fanta fantastic run uh, in the story. You you want to turn every page on that. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a, a fabulous uh, a fabulous read, uh, and certainly something that you know if it comes out in print again, um, get your get your hands on it. Well, that, that's the thing. Like you know what I mean. Like I, I, I had I you told me stories from that yes. book. Numerous sides, and it is it is definitely a book that informs and and inspires you to tell the story to someone. You know, yeah. what I mean? it's not the same as like where I think if you hand a book to someone, that's why I love secondhand books. Yeah, the fact it's passed from person to person. Why, in the case of being gifted a book, why is this person giving me this book? They obviously see something in me that yes struck a chord yes. and they were doing. Yes, but a lot of the books when they're they don't get republished. No, do you mean, and then and then they're gone, and then you treasure what you have. Yeah. You'd never lend out that book. I, I, this is this is my I I lent another copy of this, and I didn't get it back. So you learned. Well, yeah, there was a, a, a stuff going on, but um, uh, I I bought another copy because I said actually, do you know what it deserves it, and yeah. it, it has um it has in it a hanging as as a public spectacle event that everyone turns up to, yeah. a, as if it's it's some kind of entertainment. Uh, and I was just going, and the way it was written made it seem uh, normal and so exciting that somebody was going to go and see someone hanged. Uh, and I was like, okay, it was it was really strange, and it but got me into that place where you go, it brought me somewhere else. Yeah, that that's probably what you're looking for in any kind of uh, engagement. Yeah. Um, so um, I've got the Hidden Ireland here, which is Daniel Corkery book, which yeah. uh, it it must be thirty years since I've read that. But I brought us off there just as we were coming in, and I said, "God, I better bring that along." Um, and we're talking about books with stories in them. And I see you've got our Hermione Temple and Cabinet, yeah, um, Darby O'Keel and, and the Good People, yeah. And in terms of uh, cultural appropriation, she is she's listed as a British author, okay, uh, despite being from Longford. Um, yeah. No, she ended up in the States. Okay. But this is another thing where you have um, a female author's work being used by Walt Disney. Okay. Uh, and and uh, barely any acknowledgement of the original author. Okay. But she was writing short stories for magazines and publications. Yeah. The same as a lot of female writers were doing, you know, back in the day. But, um, yeah, it's a gorgeous book. Like... Cover's excellent, I have said. Well, that's, they say yeah. don't judge a book by the cover, uh, but you absolutely sorry. can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know I mean? It is. I wish people could see this, like, just embossed with the shamrocks, and it's it's a gorgeous book. Very tactile. It is. You yeah. can just feel it. But also in it, like, and again, it's one of the things I love about secondhand books is when flicking through the book, and oh, I was just so nervous about this book, there's a newspaper clipping inside it okay. which someone was obviously using as a bookmark. I probably won't find it now as I, as I okay. scroll through. But um, I love those little hidden gems or just little annotations, thing written, things written yeah. inside of books. Margin notes. Yeah, this this is the this is the clip. I don't want to okay. hold it too close to the yeah. candle. Um, President Taff is referenced on the back of it. You know. Okay. Um, it's it's just amazing because it's a snippet of a time. Yeah. I think this book is what 1901, 1902? Probably. Yeah. It's in around that time. Um, but it's amazing when someone leaves something of themselves in it. Yes. Yeah.
Yeah. I no. used to love jumble sales back in the eighties where you'd go in and you'd buy old annuals and stuff like that and be like, to Christine, happy birthday from yes. Auntie. Yes. Whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I never wanted to rub those things no. out. No. There's this kind of magic about them. But yeah. yeah. Um, so there's books of stories and there's books about stories. Okay. So there's a huge amount, well, we have a fair few inside about folklore, about yeah. mythology, but about the, 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 how would you say, the academic qualities of and those the things. the craft of it, yeah, the, yeah. breaking down of it, yeah. So there's, there's quite a bit in that, and I guess um, one of the things that always intrigued me uh, about what we do is you have the storytelling, you have the origin of the stories, you have the landscape, yeah, and all of these things are, are kind of pulled together, and there's an awful lot in it. And no matter how far you dig into it, there's always something else to yeah. find out. Yeah, it just keeps on giving you more. And the more you look, the more you see. Um, but it's like like director's commentaries and stuff like that. That additional information that only really the the nerds, the people okay, really yes, into it, will, yes. will watch and read. Yeah, and I know I uh, I picked up the second hand copy of Washington Irving's. Um, Nice the Neil Hammer, is it? Or? No, with the, with the Sleepy Hollow in it, and it was okay. the, first, the English edition of it. Yeah. But people criticised the book an awful lot because he had all his notes in it as well. Okay. And they were positioned before the story. Okay. Like, I don't want to know this okay. before I... F okay. After the point of the story, like, kind of having a greater understanding of it is, is what some people want. But you should be able to enjoy them just for what they are as well. Yeah. No, no, that, that, yeah. yes, okay. So... Then there was one thing that you were saying there about not burning the candle, and I picked up um, as we were coming in, uh, Rizzardi's um, Grammar of Fantasy. Okay. Okay, and this is about how you create stories. So it's a book about how to create stories, and it's uh, this is 50 years since it was published, so the new edition coming out this year, also uh, by translated by Jack Zipes, so yeah. as, this, as this one is. Um, but he mentions in that uh, his father, who died, his father was a baker, and his father died um, of pneumonia. But one of the things he remembers about his father is his father burning his arms before he went baking. And he would take a newspaper and set fire to it and scorch his arms so there'd be no hairs to fall into the baking. <laughs> so this is when I saw you doing that, I was immediately going, well, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, oh, the smell of burning hair, that was like, horrendous. Um, but we did, so, we did a, a, a quick short course of Pat Ryan yeah. on the creation stories. Um, and you, this really intrigued me that um, uh, Rizzardi would have, someone would have thought about how you create stories, what are the necessary components for creating stories, because it's not an easy thing to do, no. and it's not easy to do well, um, and yet we all do it, we're all yeah. making stuff up every day. Well we talk about it in terms of telling stories, like storytellers we, we chat all the time, and it's that thing like, well what do you need for a story, and you need something to happen. Yeah. somewhere for, for that thing to happen and then someone to have observed it in some way. Yes. It needs to have a witness. Yeah. Something needs to happen and it needs to be witnessed and then you've got a story. And he has a whole lot of little components in there to go, what is fascinating about this? What is fascinating about that? Yeah. Um, and so I think it's, it's if anybody's looking to explore this area, then that's a super book to, to get going with. Um, then um, I... I'll leave that to one side for a moment. This I pulled out. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. Like that. Yeah. So uh, when we set up the museum, obviously Dahi was a major help to us. Yeah. Um, and I keep going to this book because if I'm looking for uh, a way into a particular area or to discover what what it relates to, then this is my first port of call. Yeah. And it begins then to push stuff out. Uh, but throwing that back to the comment you made earlier on about when you dream, like you can't dream about someone you haven't met. You can't look through Dahi's stuff and not think about him. Yeah, no. like he, and his voice and how he communicated that stuff as well. And I think that's the importance of the storyteller when it comes to the stories as well. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, absolutely. But I think that's one of like 70 books that he produced. Yeah, no, I did. I mean, he used to correct me when I go, I know I've produced it, I've written this bit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But it was, he had no commitment issues because he was willing to put it down in black and white. Yes. He believed so readily, kind of like that he that he and he put the work in that he put it down. I love in terms of the oral storytelling, yeah. the ability to make mistakes and to 
Well, they're not necessarily mistakes because it's just a different path of the story. I, there's um, a fabulous uh, book called um, by a guy called Gaston Bachelot, and in the introduction to it, he says writing is really difficult. Mm. He says when I give lectures, sometimes the words do the thinking for me. Yeah, and because they just fly out of your mouth, and everybody everybody buys into that. Yeah. Um, so there is that magic of being present, magic of oral storytelling. Yeah. Um, and it's participative, um, and you're feeding off the audience, and they're influencing the direction the story's going as well. So, yeah. um, but we're going to talk about books. Yeah. And um, I don't know, maybe this is just a show and tell, is it now? I mean, it is like a book, bit of a show and like tell. But well, I don't think people would realize like, that these books like, are, are just sitting down like, you know, on shelves inside there. Um, what was the one recently? We were only talking about it the other day. Uh, Standish O'Grady. Oh, yes. Uh, where there was uh, uh, a friend of mine had seen the book on the shelf, and yeah. they're like, Trinity College has one copy of this book, and yeah. it's missing. Yes. And yet, this is places in Aladdin's cave of, of, of books lying around the place. So, it, it is a show and tell. I love the cover of this next Yeah, the cover. I, I bought a, there's another one I bought because the cover. Now, I have this in, in a later reprint, but I saw this kind of crazy 70s psychedelic mm. cover, and I went, actually, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, and. Um, you think of the work someone put in to concept this, to conceive this and then sell it to the publisher and the author that this is the right vibe to go with. Yeah. Michael Dane's book, really accessible. Yeah. It's got pictures in it and maps and yes. stories. Um and it keeps you moving along. I'd say some of the stuff in it you'd kind of look at it and go academically, you'd yeah. go you'd want to tease that a bit harder. Yeah. But really great place to start, great place to get into stuff. Yeah. And it also gets you thinking. Um, because you, a, a lot of stuff, I like to make sure I've got a second source or a third source yeah. that you match it up against and go, well, there's the diff there's the there's the way people think about that thing. Yeah, um, and, yeah, and this, wait. As, yeah, but this gets you in, yeah, and then you can begin to, to, to push it out from there. But I, I say, I love, I love the thing, I love the ambition of it, uh, yeah. of the book. And, and the back of it as well, because it's, so, yeah. it's, it's a gorgeous. And it's Townsend Hudson, so not, yeah. what's not to like on that? Um, so this is only, I would say, what one percent? Yeah, if even of an ever growing. It, it, this is a dwindling percentage. The the yes, I the difficulty is trying to find a good story. Yeah, and a good story you can tell, um, and you have to go to an awful lot of um, raw material to find a way to get to a story. Yeah, um, and oftentimes there are only references to things that, and then you've got to go and find out well, what's that about. And yeah. then, but as long as you're going to stay true to it, and like the books will give you, like this book here now. Um, and I know I'm sad about this because it's it's not being printed anymore. So okay, it's going out of publish. Um, and we've been had this in the museum since October 2016. Yeah, and I it. it 1,989 copies sold. Yeah. That's how many people's hands we've put this book into. Yeah. But when we, the storytellers, go through this book and we're like looking at stories, how they're written in the books, we usually find the endings quite weak. Yes. How, how a story ends in writing and how you finish it in a room yes. with people. It's so different. Yeah. Uh, and also as storytellers, as good storytellers, you need to know you need to have an understanding of what comes before the story and after the yeah. story. And when it's a standalone piece, you don't have that. I find it really, you're absolutely right. And I find it really difficult sometimes when you start to tell a story, you go, oh yeah, but then there was a bit before that. Yeah. And then you go, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. But you have to really know about what happened there. Yeah. But great storytellers do that. Like Billy Connolly, I, I think is an amazing storyteller. Yeah. But he does that thing where you've gone off on a tangent, but there's something you need to come back with yes. to complete the circle. And the book I don't have here is Brian Boyd's On the Origin of Stories, yeah. which um, has a great chapter in it about um, uh, Odysseus yeah. and the uh, uh, Homer's Iliad. Um, and it starts the night before he returns home. Yeah. And he says, but I have to take you back to the beginning. So we know he's going home the next day, but we have yeah. to go all the way back to the beginning to find out what has happened up to that point. And these are all tricks, de devices, probably. Well, no, tricks is good. Yeah. You know, because it is, it's trickery, it's magic. Um, then on this one, and I have only got, I have to admit, um, 
that's a, that's as far as I've got in this book. <laughs> okay, but it's a meaty book. It's though. a meaty book. What re, what I stopped at that point because there was a, um, he was talking about um, the beginning of t tourism in the Killarney area, which is really the first tourist destination yeah. in the country, um, and that the the uh, the the uh, boatmen on the on the lake at Loch Lane would take people out, and he was they were they were graded for the quality of their storytelling. Yeah, and that the recommended the guidebooks recommended certain storytellers that if you were going out for a day on the lake over to the island to have a picnic, yeah. that these were the best guys to get because they had the best stories, and the entertainment would be there for your day. And you go. That's a, uh, for me. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I don't see a guidebook nowadays that goes, "Oh, you should stay in this hotel because the concierge tells fabulous stories." Uh, you would love to be able to produce that. Of course, like now, where people kind of move around quite a bit more, it's nice when you go to a place and you find that person who's been there forever. When we went to Lock Crew, yes, um, and we were in the little cottage, and yeah. we were being shown like the, uh, you know, all the different bits and pieces they had, and they showed us the uh, the crib. Yeah. And there's a photograph of a baby in the crib. Yeah. And next thing we turn around and I can't remember the lady's name, but she pointed out Michael, who was this man in his seventies. Yeah. And he's the baby in the photograph. Yeah. So he's been there, he's part of it. You can return and he's a constant part of it. Yeah. But when you're going down to when you're let's say you're writing a book to recommend meet this person when they're there, they mightn't still be there. It's yes. more kind of transient, like kind of people are there for a limited amount of time before they move on. Well, I, I'll give you a it's a funny for me, the funny part is um, the, the guy who owned the house, Martin, I met his nephew at a virtual reality storytelling conference in New York. <laughs> and he told me about his uncle yeah. who lived in the cottage yeah. at Lock Crew. Yeah, because I said, I, said, I said Michael, I was wrong. Yeah, it, was, it was Martin. But it yeah. was, um, uh, it's just funny because um, everybody's looking for some way to root themselves. Yeah. Um, and that we... we you know, and our, um, I guess even more now, um, that we're looking for natural things, we're looking to be part of nature. We're yeah. looking to be grounded to uh, be embodied with the, with, with, with the world, I guess. And rather than the, the, the kind of, um, um, how to say, the hyperactivity we, we, we were used to right up to yeah. the lockdown. Um, so. And and with that, because with that, that's why books are so like physical books are so important because yeah. it is something you can hold and it's yours and it's it's there on a shelf you can look and see it and, and it's a possession that you have. Yeah. Um. Because they're they're there when our memories fail us as well, but we can remember things of like course. I have that physical thing. Yeah. There's yeah no there is and there's there's something nice about having a you know something that you know it's got kinesthetics. You yeah. Know? It has all these things that yeah. you, properties you can ascribe to it. Um, there's still books I go to and I remember little snippets from that book and I can almost I can hit within 10 pages of where that snippet is it's going to be uh, yeah um, but there is like and they're hard things to give away a book that has meaning for you yeah is a hard thing to part with I think yeah I, I still have like the books I read to my kids when they were little yes I still have like the physical yeah. books and I, I, I will I will always keep them Actually, I'll, I'll give them to them when they have their children as well. Yeah. A little four euro copy of Slinky Malinky, like this, like, yeah. so terrible, and it's yeah. got baby food on and stuff like yeah. that, but it's, I do keep it because it's, it's it's my memories now. Yeah. 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 I never got into Kindles. I never got into the whole electronic Tried it, kind didn't of, really, didn't re work for me. No. But, yeah, no, no, it, and I'm sure they work for some people, and look, I can see in many circumstances where it's, it, they're, they're a boon to have. Um, I got a Kindle, but it's it's um, or an Amazon product, but it has a podcast on it. Yeah. I, for whatever reason, I I just couldn't get into the the whole not being able to turn the page or. Well, in relation to books, where do you think podcasts exist? Are they somewhere between story oral storytelling and, and and a book? Yeah. I well, okay. So one thing you don't have, you don't have the oral storytelling. You've got an audience present. Yeah. So you don't have the audience present. What you do have is. Uh, the voice of the author, yeah. so it becomes um, clearer uh, what the nuances in the language are. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, it also, um, I think, 
things like vulnerability come across much more then as yeah. you're listening to someone talking. Um, but as uh, was it Oscar Wilde said, if you can fake s sincerity, you've got it made. And I, <laughs> I, you know, there's plenty of know. <laughs> yeah, there's plenty of storytellers out there. Uh, you know, and that's the quality they have is to bring people in and be persuasive. So I think there's an interesting thing there. The other comment I heard about podcasters is they don't really know who's listening. No. So it, and the environment that they're listening to it in as well. So what what I see, what I hear more and more about is is oh yes, most people who listen to this are uh, in uh, commuting. Yeah. Or they're in a they they've got a defined commute time, 25, 45, an hour and a half, whatever it is. Yeah. And the they're consuming material that's taken away from the tin tube they're in. Yeah. Whether it's a car or a train or a bus or a plane. Um, um, so that's where it sits. And I think it's, it's, look, it's a relatively new medium. Yeah. Um, uh, and something you, be, I think it's been picked up more and more now. I, it's, it's, it's becoming more mainstream. Is that? And um, yeah, the thing I love about that is, is, is accessibility. I mean, it, 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 I'm, that's, that's why, it's why I, what I love about the museum, suddenly you have the weight of all these incredible authors and, and centuries of stories that we can now put in a way and in, in a framework that allows anyone to come in. There's no... Yeah. Academics, hens, parties, families, where, and we've had, we had a family in before and there was five generations yeah. of the family yes. on a tour. And, and to call the place the National Leprechaun Museum, to give that fun element, meant it was open for them to come in and, and get it as well. And one of the things we always said, there's no uh, barrier. To, if I go to an art museum, I need to know something about art in yeah. order for me to, to, to really get, a, for me to get meaning yeah. out of it. With this, the, the barrier to entry is very low. Yeah. Uh, um, and the only people who find a barrier to entry is the ones who put the barrier up themselves. It, it's, it's their not, making, yeah. it's a fair making. Yeah. Um, so, absolutely, I think it is, these stories, um, the ones that we tell were for general consumption. Yeah. It, adults or children, they were for general consumption. Um, and my feeling is that we're bringing that back to people so it's they're accessible as you say it's kind of yeah. retail retail yeah. stories um yeah no i'm just thinking with just whatever whenever time you say anything i'm always just thinking oh that it makes me think of that and i suppose that's the the beauty and the treasure of of having a one-to-one -one or having storytelling is you can think and react at the time when you're reading a book you can't respond to the author you can't in make an inquiry about it. No, and they have to make a decision of what words to put on the page. Yeah. And if you're sitting there as a storyteller and you're leaning in, more interested in one part of that story, yeah. they can embellish that, they can take it in a particular direction. If you've got less time, they can shorten the story up. Yeah. If they have more time, they can lengthen it out. Yeah. Um, you are listening to with other people though, which means the storytellers um, managing that group of people. Yeah. Um, but unlike a book, it's a shared experience, and it's a group experience. Yeah. And that makes it for a much deeper, for me, a much deeper. Yeah. Social, because we're we're essentially social animals. Yeah. And it makes for a social engagement, and we're all sharing that same um, understanding. And I suppose one of the things when we were talking about podcasts there a second ago, it's rare you'd see anybody on the street now without an earphone in. True. Um, and um, uh, 20 years ago, it'd be rare to see someone on the street without a cigarette. You know, it's, it's yeah. yeah, and now <laughs> um, we're consuming them as individuals. Um, and our terms of reference as a groups are sort of more chopped up now. Yeah. Because we don't have, it's not as if everybody sits and watches a late, late show on a Friday night or a particular show at a particular time and we come into school or work the next day and talk about that show. Yeah. And everybody gets it. Now we have much more communities of interest and people are yeah. not having that shared experience. Now, and I think that's vital for us. Well then how do you how do you share a book? Like I love reading out loud. You know what I mean? And and I can share that way. But it's it's a very if you think of like like a Jack and Ori, yeah, where someone reads a book to you, yeah. But again, those words are there, so that's what you're reading from. Um, 
But how do you feel about people reading from a book in terms of how it relates to, to storytelling? Um, I do well, I know um, if the, the quality to reading from a book that's, that's, that's better than reading the book yourself. So hearing a story yeah. is up a notch. Telling a story is up another notch. Yeah. Um, because when you're not looking at the book, you're looking at the person you're telling the story to. Yeah. Um, and that creates, and you get that thing where there's mirror neurons firing and all that stuff begins to happen. Mm. Um, and we know it works. We've seen it work here. Yeah. Um, but also, I think Pat Ryan's latest study and some of the studies they're doing on the fMRI scanning yeah. show a noticeable difference between a book being read to you or a story being told to you. And like, there's much more brain activity when you're being told a story. Like I will I will never read this book. Okay. I will probably never read it. Okay. I, don't, yeah, yeah. I don't feel that I have to though, because okay. of like, the joy of you know, going to listen to you. And even on the fourth and fifth time of the ten <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. But it's just it's because I, I won't get as much from the book as I get from hearing someone speak passionately about it. And I appreciate that. And one of the things that when I find these books and I think there's something in it. Yeah. And I go, I have, I, I feel I have to go and tell people it's about a, it's the It's a fuel. Yeah. It fuels your passion for the engagement. But the stories, the, the books on their own without being able to, you know, retell or, or, or discuss it with people, it just feels a little bit flatter. Is that why book clubs exist and Chardonnay? Yeah, I was going to say... <laughs> Book clubs were were started by 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 the drinks industry. That's yeah. that's where they were started, particularly the the vineyards. Oh, no, I I think that um, uh, as a technology, yeah, as an information technology, books have a really great place. And but things are moving on now, and we have all these other technologies coming in. Yeah. Um. But one of the things we hunger for is that human communication. Yeah. Um. And that understanding that. Uh, as, a, as communities around the world, we're roughly all the same. Um, yeah. And storytelling is a way of bridging those gaps. Um, and people come in here and... You, you did One of the remarkable things I always found about here is after people have been through the tour, after 45 minutes of, of hearing stories, and at the end they go, I remember a story I was told. Yeah. Or, and whatever culture it is, it takes about 45 minutes for their brain to kind of click into gear yeah. and go, I want to tell you something. And they relate a story, usually from deep in their past. Yeah. Um, about, and it informs the way they approach the world. Absolutely, There's a kind yeah. of like, they've embodied that story. Yeah. Um, and that's why I think some of the fairy stories are so powerful. Um, because people actually get a feeling for it. A feeling within themselves and Rizzardi says it in, in his book the key element in Hansel and Gretel is the oven there's yeah there's all these coding up with it the heat yeah. the danger the food the smell everything is and that that, that the, the cage the kids are in is a, is a relationship to the oven and yeah and um, so there's all these things worked into stories and that's why they're so powerful and um, and I can only imagine the difference between reading Hansel and Gretel as a kid or someone telling you Hansel and Gretel by yeah. candlelight. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, in a I cottage. A, yeah. I don't think as a kid I would have been okay with that. Yeah. Uh, because reading them had enough of, a, of an impact. Um, yeah. But I, I love that. What I love about reading books is that the time I give myself to read okay. is so important. Yeah. And given that what we do generally, obviously yeah. we're in a different time at the moment, a different phase at the moment, but the overwhelming kind of nature of being around so many people, you do need that alone time to just sit and, and digest. Absolutely. Well. And, and books are a therapy in, in that regard. I think um, you read at your own pace. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and you read what you're interested in. Yeah. And you find things of interest in what you're reading. I think that's, yeah. And I think it's amazing. I think they are amazing. Yeah. Um, and I think they, they provide, a, like we can't speak to someone from 1830 no. But we can read what the, how they were thinking about yeah. things. Um, so, yeah, I complete, completely get that. Um, and it's amazing um, the amount of books being published now. Yeah. I, just, like, it's, I would find it very difficult to, to set out an, on a stall to be a, a, an author of a novel um, that would be 
Yeah, but it, it, we've seen it every day, new ones being announced, and I suppose probably what we're plugged into, the machine we're plugged into, yeah. we see these, yeah. we're notified of this thing is being published. Yes. But it's amazing how much more accessible, again, it is to publish a book. I can only imagine what it took to, to publish something like this, you know, yeah. back in the day. But nowadays, with like Kickstarter and all these things where your community, your people will facilitate, yes. help you realise that thing you want to do. Yeah. That demand is still there, even now, like with the current situation of, of people wanting books. Yeah. They just, they want them. They want to, they want to just consume them. So I have a final question for okay. you. Okay. Given the, because books are very seasonal in terms of the certain books you read at certain times of the year. Obviously I was chewing up an awful lot of Delights of Sleepy Hollow. Okay. Because it was around Halloween. Yeah. But that we're coming into a kind of a festive time. Yeah. What's the story or what's the book that you associate most with this time of year? With this time of year? Yeah, I know I'm trying to add you. I didn't, didn't prep you with this. I haven't. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to get into a Dickens book this year. So yeah, I think I'll pick a Dickens that. book out. Um, the book that blew me away, though, and when, you're talk when I just mentioned that, um, um, was The Age of Innocence. Yeah. And I just like that was that was I just found that phenomenal. Mm. Edith Wharton. I found yeah. that um there was just so much going on and I was just hooked from the beginning. Um so it's a book that kind of picks this time of year out, probably that. Yeah. Yeah, the age of innocence. For, and, for, for whatever reason. And, and obviously around, around Christmas time, which which be coming up soon enough, like in, in my family, giving books as gifts was was always a big Okay. Thing. What's that what's the book you'd gift? that person who is that person or, or even what's, what's that book that you just go you're going to love me for giving you this oh my goodness I know I'm so sorry for telling us that um, I, it's going to depend on the recipient I yeah. think um, and it should yeah I think um, there's certain books that you know uh, I've given people or we've as a family have given people um, and they've just hit the spot yeah people go that's exactly I didn't know I needed that. Yeah. Um. And, um, but giving people things, it's It's like finding stories. It's it's difficult to find the right note. That I, I'd never be a DJ. I cannot pick a tune out that suits the mood. Yes, yeah. it's not my bag. But um, um, I think finding a book, a good book for someone, and saying I think you'll enjoy that. It's it's tough going. But it also needs you need to have an insight into that person. Because you're telling them what you think about them by giving them the book. Yeah. So you could quite easily insult someone by. You and know, you always, yeah, a lot of times, you're shading up. You go, "Oh, I enjoyed this. I thought you might have been yeah, interested yeah, yeah. in such and such." Because there's always that worry that people won't think it's as amazing as you think it is. And it's the same with recommending anything—a restaurant, an experience. Yes. Whatever that experience, when you recommend someone's like, "What if they don't like it as much as I love?" Yeah, and all like our experiences are of a moment in time yeah. of a particular thing at the at and, and things fell into place at that and uh, it is uh, you know that's just been art and science you know you can you can replicate science you yeah. can't replicate art and uh, living is an art uh, and living well is an art yeah um, and it's what we all aspire to. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> we say we're going to talk about books, so we talk about everything, but like okay. I mean, it's like there is no one one book. Yeah. Uh, but thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, uh, Mark. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. Thank you. If you've any questions about any books here in the museum, just just give us a shout. We'll reference these books okay. underneath the video. Yeah. Uh, so you guys can check them out. But thank you so much, and we'll see you guys again soon. I'm sorry. Thank you.